So in today's video, we are going to be talking about data acquisition and analysis of the heat pump. Now, out of the box, there isn't too much to see. You've got some real-time information, but you've got very limited historical information. You can see how much energy was consumed on a particular day or a particular week, but the information isn't particularly user-friendly. Now, what I will summarize in saying is that heat pumps and generally the heating industry as a whole, they are excellent for matters of control. There's a lot of control options, but they're poor on data acquisition and historical data storage. Conversely, my inverter, the solar industry in, as a whole, they are excellent for data acquisition and historical data storage, but they're very poor on controls, as I've mentioned in previous videos. So we need to redress this balance when it comes to data acquisition. And what do we have here? We have got an, what's known as an ESP32. This is a microcontroller, and we're gonna talk about this in some detail. This is used for acquiring data and then transmitting it to a data storage device. The question is gonna be, well, what is this data storage device and what means does it use to do so? So we need to transmit data to a device which is gonna be switched on all the time and is capable of handling information and storing it. So we're gonna go upstairs and I'm going to introduce you to the subject matter of my very first YouTube video. Well, here we are in the loft. What do I have in the loft? Well, I've got a Raspberry Pi and we're going to have a look in closer detail as to what I've been using that Raspberry Pi for up until now. Okay, let's go and take a closer look. So here is my Raspberry Pi. Um, let's go and take a closer look. Just like this. And here we are. So this is a box of tricks. We've got a Raspberry Pi down here. It is controlling some relay outputs and it is also acquiring sensor and temperature data. So we've got uh, sensor light switches which go into this device here. We've got relay outputs. There's two relay boards stacked on top of each other. So I've got six relays. They control the lights and the fans for the bathrooms. And that is all I've used the Raspberry Pi up until very, very recently. Very straightforward, nice small device. It's, uh, it's less than the length of my finger. And yet it's capable of so much more. So in recent days and weeks, I've turned it into a web server and I've turned it into what's known as an MQTT broker. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So this project is now over four and a half years old and it's been operating very reliably indeed. But in recent months, I've wanted to up the standards of this project. It used to do control. Now it's also providing information which I can then use to determine whether things are going well or not. So as we can see, we've got a web server on the Raspberry Pi itself. Uh, you can see the local IP address and you can see the status of the fans and the lights. So as you can see, there is a sensor switch here, which is on. Um, there's also a sensor for whether a hot shower is being taken. And what that will do is that it will keep the fans going for much longer, 50 minutes. Um, and uh, all this information, it's served up by a web server, but all the times and the temperatures and the timestamp at the bottom, that's all served up by a program which is running on Python. This is the automation program. And the link between the automation program, which is Python and the web server, is a protocol which is known as MQTT. And this is the protocol that we are going to be using for 
the heat pump. Now, as an example, you can see that we've got uh, underfloor temperatures of about 14 degrees and 12 degrees, but data flows in both directions using MQTT. So I can press this button, manual override, the lights have turned off, and I can turn on these lights, the cabinet, bathroom lights, for example, on. I can turn on the main light, on, and so on. And I don't particularly want to do that for, for now, but the point is, is that MQTT is a system which I've now got set up, and I can use the Raspberry Pi to gather the data from the heat pump using the microcontroller. So let's have a look at the microcontroller in a bit more detail. So one of the things I want to demonstrate with this microcontroller is how little power this thing actually uses. So we will plug this in like so. Then it's on. And as you can see, it's using very small fractions of a watt. So about 0 0.2 watts, if you can see that in closer detail, let's just zoom in a little bit. Yep, 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 watts. Bear in mind, this thing has got Wi-Fi. And because it's such a low power consumption, we can plug this in using a serial port 5 volt supply and it will just work. So we're going to use this in more detail. So this device here, it's called the ESP1. This is a microcontroller, as I've mentioned before. It is different to a Raspberry Pi. A Raspberry Pi is basically a miniature computer. It is a microprocessor. It will have an operating system. It will take time to boot up. This thing on its own has got nothing on it. It's got no operator station. You need to program these devices uh, using source code, using, uh, an, uh, using a, a piece of software called Platform IO in this particular example. Once you've programmed it, it will do a very specific thing until you then rewrite the program. So all the data on here is stored on what's known as EEPROM. So this is, uh, uh, this is read-only memory, but it can be programmed uh, in particular instances. So it's uh, very different to a microprocessor, and there are probably other people who are better explained uh, to explain the difference. But we're going to use this in order to harvest the data from our heat pump. So we're going to take a closer look at the projects which are involved with this. So this is the project which is used to integrate the microcontroller with your Daikin heat pump. It's called ESP Alfirma. You can get it on GitHub. So you need to have an ESP32 microcontroller and you also need to have some cabling. So the cabling is basically just wires with what are known as DuPont connectors on them, uh, female connectors on both ends of the wire. So in this example, they have shown a preview of what your dashboard will look like if you integrate it with Home Assistant. Now, in this instance, we're not going to be using Home Assistant. I don't particularly want to buy another Raspberry Pi for that we're going to use the existing Raspberry Pi. And in order to do that, we're going to roll up our sleeves and get dirty with Python. So what do we need? Well, we need an ESP32. Um, and in particular, they make a reference to the M5 Stick C. Now I wanted to buy the M5 Stick C to begin with. Um, you can get it on the Pi Hut or at least you could last time I checked, but there is a very specific problem for Scottish uh, purchasers. If we go here, they have restrictions on lithium battery shipping. It cannot be sent to Scotland. It's only able to be sent to England and Wales. Now, since my investigations on this, it is now out of stock, it's sold out. So instead, I went for another board this is an ESP1. This is the ESP32 one, which I've mentioned before. Um, it has uh, IO headers, so you don't need to solder them on. Here they are. And uh, that cost me uh, £16.20 plus shipping. 
So all told, it was about £19 from the Pi Hut. It arrived uh, pretty much one or two days after I placed the order. So in order to get started with this, you need to have what's known as Platform I.O. This is an add-on to Microsoft's uh, Visual Studio code. We've got it open here, and you can go to platformio.org. And somewhere here, you can see Get Platform I.O. Now. So you can get it for Visual Studio Code. So you can just get that, and it will download, and you can then install it. So the result is that you get this. Once you've downloaded uh, the uh, ESP Alfirma uh, project, you can view that on GitHub. Okay, so you can just download the zip file right there. Download it, put it in a folder of your choice. And then once you've got Platform IO installed on Microsoft Visual Code, you can then open up your Alfirma project on here. So if we go through this procedure, what do we see? You need to uh, set the corresponding environment. So if we go down here, it's set to default. But if you want to go to mstick 5 c let's see, yep, m 5 stick c that's where it is. But I've just got it on default environment. Then the next thing you want to do is you want to go to setup.h. Now here you want to define the IP address for your Wi-Fi here. You want to define your SSID and your password. And I need to remind myself to blank that out for the sake of the video. We've got the Wi-Fi gateway, which is also the name of the router. And we've got a, a secondary DNS. Then we also need the MQTT server. So this is my Raspberry Pi. So it is going to be 217. I haven't got a username or password. Default port is going to remain as it is. You can also retrieve values as often or as infrequently as you want from the heat pump. So at the moment, it's every 30 seconds. You can retrieve them every second if you want to, but every 30 seconds is going to be more than adequate. So this is where I got stuck quite a lot. So if you've got an M5 stick C, which I keep getting wrong, I call it an M stick 5C for some reason, M stick 5C, you use pins 26 and 36, and you can see that set here. Now, if the default environment, if the environment is set for M5 stick C, these will become enabled, but they're not, they're grayed out. So we're using the default GPIO pins. They were recommending pins 16 and 17. Now, I misunderstood this. So if we go to the pin out, you've got your pin numbers here. And I thought pin 16 here, pin 17 there. Turns out they were talking about the GPIO numbers, these ones here. It took about four hours for me to figure this one out. But you see this pin here, number 33, this is an LED. So I defined the transmit pin to be on GPIO 21, as you can see here. And then I chose number 32, which is right next to it as being the receive pin. What this meant was that I didn't have to connect it up to the Arduino in order to confirm that this LED was flashing. So what I'll do is just demonstrate that. So when we plug this in, you've got two LED lights there. But you will also see between the green and the white one, there is a very faint one, which is also flashing. You might not be able to see it, but maybe you will. That was flashing as frequently as the MQTT was trying to publish logs to the MQTT broker. So once I got this solved, if we scroll down here, you're supposed to uncomment items which uh, you want to use. So in this particular instance, we want to use the uh, reference for the Alfirma EGRA. It's an EHVH uh, Hydrobox. I can't remember the exact details, but this one seemed to be the best fit, so I uncommented it here. What we then did was that we go onto another file here, and then we can choose what data we want to extract from here. 
We've got a uh, different operation mode. And in particular, I decided I wanted to look at defrost operation. We've got outdoor air temperature, primary current for the inverter for the main compressor unit. We've got pressure, but I find that that is a value of zero. I'm not too sure what kind of pressure it is. So I'm just going to uncomment it here. Set point for the hot water, leaving water set point, backup heater step one, backup heater step two. So these are the three kilowatt elements for your backup heater. So it's six kilowatts in total. We've got the leaving water before and after the backup heater. You'll remember that from the piping diagram. Inlet water temperature, that is for the return leg of the uh, of your central heating flow. You've got the hot water tank temperature, indoor ambient temperature, flow sensor. Uh, we've got refrigerant pressure sensor. This water pressure here, it gave minus 29.92 as being the uh, answer to water pressure, which didn't really make any sense because the water pressure is about 1.9 bar. And minus 29.92, that sounds like inches of mercury to me, and it sounds like a sensor which is not wired in. So I reckon that's probably the water pressure for your hot water when it's connected to an external water pump. So I think uh, an external water pump in places where you've got low pressure, um, they can be started and stopped uh, from the heat pump here. So that is probably not applicable. Um, I'll just simply leave it on just because it is moderately interesting. The other thing we've got is target delta T heating. So that is the difference in temperature between the flow and the return temperature. And that difference is controlled by your circulation pump. So the faster your circulation pump is, the, sl the smaller your gap is going to be. So you can get that information here. This is the voltage for the inverter on the other side of the uh, compressor. So this is not giving you supply voltage. And we're going to talk about the fact that there is no data here for actual real power supply here. Um, and that is uh, a bit of a challenge, shall we say, because we don't have information on the supply voltage from this. And we do not have any information about the power factor uh, for, the, uh, in, for, for the heat pump. But we have other ways of getting that information. The other thing I want to just mention is that the primary current here is only the current going to the inverter. It is not the current which is used by the hydrobox for ancillary operations, such as being on standby and running the pump. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on. You have set these things. You can connect your ESP32. Very important, go on to Device Manager, scroll down to COM ports, check that you've got COM3 here. If you do not have COM3, if you've got an issue with things, with drivers not being properly installed, then this next step won't work. Um, I had this issue and I had to go and find where the drivers for this were. Um, it took a little bit of research and I cannot recall the details, sadly. But once you have done this, you can verify the uh, software that you've got. So here we are verifying the software. That's it. And then we will just simply click on upload. Now, whilst that is happening, we'll just go on to command. You will recall that we have a particular IP address here. So we can just type in ping 192.168.1.218. And of course, it's being uh, written to at the moment, so it's not in operation. But as soon as it becomes marked as complete, I'll just show you how quickly this thing becomes operational. There's literally no boot time whatsoever. 
and here we are 100% and success and then we just ping it okay and there we are it's uh, responded pretty quickly so the next thing we want to do is go onto my Raspberry Pi and here is my Raspberry Pi I've also recently updated the operating system software it was on Raspberry and Stretch just recently and I've been told that's out of support so it's now upgraded to Raspberry and Buster so if we go so we can subscribe and this is something that we need to talk about what is an MQTT server well it's basically it's a communication protocol it's between devices and it's also between programs on a device you can send uh, analog uh, you can send floating point data any kind of binary data between two devices using this so in this particular instance we have a publisher which is the microcontroller and we have a broker which is the Raspberry Pi uh, broker server in this particular instance I've used Mosquito and we also have subscribers and subscribers in this particular instance will be my Python programs and it will also be the web server which I have used in fact it won't be the web server it will be people's individual desktop web browsers it's a javascript a query so that is client side so in this instance we can also use a subscription function which is included in MQTT and we can subscribe to ESP Alpha and we can subscribe to any topic and what you can see is that number one it's proving that the Wi-Fi connection from the microcontroller is working correctly and it is receiving log data from the microcontroller so now we can take this and we can plug it in so now this is programmed up so we can unplug it here and we can plug it in to our heat pump so we are now going to open this up to see how the Arduino is connected inside the unit so in here we've got these clips like so and then we'll just lift this up and out and you'll see there's a cable which attaches to the display unit on the front so we just put that out of the way and you could probably ask the question why don't they just hinge it and the best answer I can come up with without actually asking Daikin is probably because it's installed in awkward locations where access is quite limited so now we need to undo these bolts so I just undo these ones very important you don't drop them down here So, this is now going to be just moved out of the way up here. We'll move this cable off to the side, like so. And we'll open up this hatch here. It's quite warm in here. So, here we are. Sometimes you can hear a, a relay clicking, especially when you hook up the uh, uh, five volt supply so let's take a, a closer look in here so here you can see we've got a five pin DuPont connector connected onto X10A terminal which you can probably just see there yep so what we got we've got five volts the red wire ground which is the black wire on pin five and then we've got pin two and three pin two is transmit pin free is received so this is a standard RS232 connection so that's very interesting and now we'll just hook uh, close everything back up again so that's this hooked up um, you probably noticed the light has flashed on and off I think one of these is a loose connection so in due course I will fix those uh, connections so that they're nice and tight in the meantime we'll just put this back on
And that's it. That's all we have to do. Have we got a light? Yes, we do. So the Arduino will just simply stay there. So as you can now see, we have got data. So we can see that the MQTT subscription is seeing this message from the ATTR topic. So we've got defrost operation, outdoor air temperature, inverted primary current, set point, leaving water temperature, backup heater step one and two, and it's refreshing every 30 seconds. So what we're going to do now is we are going to actually look at the Python program, which can then read this. So this is what my program will do. So we define a lot of variables with a value of zero to begin with. We will import various libraries. We import time. We import the uh, MQTT uh, client from Paho. That's another uh, conversation altogether. And we also import date and time. I'm not too sure why I'm uh, importing time and date time, but that's probably redundant. We define the MQTT broker, which is uh, the Raspberry Pi. We define the name of the client, which is going to be Heat Pump Data Harvester. And then we will start a loop. Uh, within this loop, we will define the date and time, and we will subscribe to a particular topic. So in this case, we are subscribing to ATTR, ESP Alpha, ATTR. So that's the name of the topic. And we define a variable. This is the variable. And the variable is basically this long message here. So what do we do with this long message? Well, we split it. So we will define variables for each component of this message. And we will define a split using the comma. So as you can see, between each topic, we got a comma. So we've got a comma between defrost operation and outdoor air temperature, for example. So once we have got defrost as an example, we want to split it again. And this time we want to split it on a colon. So as you can see here, we've got the description on the left side of the colon and we've got the state on the right side of the colon. So in this case, the defrost operation is off. And we do this for each topic of interest. Now, one of the things we will say is that if the backup heater is one is on, then we can assume that the power output is going to be 3000. There's no modulation on these uh, resistive heaters at all. So it's either 3000 or it's zero. Same with the uh, stage two backup heater. If it's on, it's 3000. If it's not on, it's equal to zero. This is where some calculation is needed for the power consumption. As I said before, we only have an input for the current value for the inverter. So what do we do? We multiply the current by the voltage. We will talk about these numbers in a bit more detail, but 241 volts is a measured voltage supply, which I have seen during this run. We can get some more accurate voltage data from the solar inverter. That will be another topic using Modbus. We are adding 17 watts. This is the base load for the heat pump that is just for keeping the heat pump on and your sensors running. So this is the standby power consumption. And then we've also got the circulation pump, which is inside the house. And in my experience, when you've got this plus the pump, but no, in, but no compressor running, you're getting about 60 watts of power. So at the maximum speed, you're getting about 25 liters per minute. Multiply that by two, that's 50 watts plus 17, that's about 65 watts. And the actual power consumption is about 61. So as you can see here, we've got about 62 watts of power being drawn by the system. I can hear the pump is running. When the pump is not running, this will typically drop down to about 17 watts of power. And when the 
compressor is running, what I find is that there is pretty good correlation between my calculated power consumption and the power consumption shown on this energy meter. So uh, we can cycle through different attributes here. We've got 245 volts because our sunshine is absolutely hoaching outside and we're exporting a lot. If we go here, 0.75 amps. So it sounds like the pump has just kicked in, maybe 137 kilowatt hours as total. I'm not too sure what that is. And that's the export, not terribly interesting. 62 watts, okay. So 0.7 amps, that's quite a low power factor. Interesting. So, um, there is power factor you need to take into account when it comes to these calculations. And I don't have access to that power factor calculation, which is a bit of a shame, unfortunately. Would be nice to get that information. Then we've got the backup heater and this backup heater. So that in total makes up your entire power consumption. Now, produced power is also very interesting. And this is produced power into the house. So we take the temperature difference between your leaving water temperature and your return temperature. And you multiply that by the flow rate. And then you multiply it by the density. No, that gives you the mass per minute per uh, multiplied by degrees. You multiply that by the specific heat capacity of water, which is 4,184 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. You divide that by 60 to give you uh, instead of joules per kilogram per degree Celsius, you get it per, per second. Joules per second, that's watts. You add the power consumption for the heat pump because, of course, that is producing power, that is consuming power, but it's also releasing that as useful energy in the form of heat. Same with the circulation pump. That will end up in your house somehow. So your coefficient of performance is simply power produced divided by power consumed. We want to look at the temperature difference between the indoor and outdoor temperatures. And we also want to look at the flow, re flow return temperature difference as well. So what do we do with that? Well, then we print this. And basically, we print it to console. And this is the result. So we've got all the information. You can see that the temperature inside the house is 22.2 degrees. So quite warm. We'll talk about that later. Um, you can see that the power consumption is 66 watts and the power produced is minus 273. Why is that? Why are we having negative power? It's because the inlet water temperature is ever so slightly higher than the outlet water temperature. So it's in a, it, the pump is circulating, but the compressor is not running. Water pressure, again, minus 29. I think this is minus 29 inches of mercury. I think that's just an open loop. Uh, refrigerant pressure, I'm guessing this is bar. This will ramp up and down. This is useful more for checking leaks over a long period of time. So we know what the reference point is for today. In two or three years time, we can look at the refrigerant pressure and compare it to what it was at the brand new. And we can use that to determine whether there are any leaks in the, in the system. Okay. So that is almost everything, but not quite. What else do we do? We want to do something useful, and this is what we do. We open a text file, this file here. We create a header with all of these little titles. We have a tab separation between all of the different titles. We then create output. And we've got tight outputs for each topic that we have uh, extracted. And we basically say, if the size of this text file is equal to zero, we create the header, we write the header. Otherwise, we then just simply write the output. And we repeat this process every 30 seconds. So that is what it's doing. And the interesting thing is going to be 
this particular file here. So let's have a look at heatpump.txt. That's what we've got. So now we have got the means with which to extract data from our heat pump. In the next video, we are going to be looking at that data in a lot more detail and trying to extract what we can learn from how our heat pump is behaving in different situations. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank you all for watching and I will talk to you again very soon.